So, um, so we will be talking about um, languages and context and aerial uh, phenomena. And uh, well, in the simplest uh, definition, language context is the use of more than one language in one in the same place at the same time. And language context often leads to context-induced change, which typically involves more or less direct importation of linguistic features from one language to another. This is basics. So you have words like animal, coffee, tea, avocado, perestroika, ombudsman, algebra. Very exciting for some people, not for everyone. Uh, so the question is, what's theoretically interesting about those? Uh, Mark is already yasping, <laughs> yawning. <laughs> <laughs> yes, so <laughs> there are at least <laughs> two perspectives. <laughs> so what are the possible outcomes of language contact in different parts of the language system? And to what extent is it possible to use various kinds of linguistic phenomena for reconstructing contact? So when it comes to words, borrowed words, uh, words differ as to how easily they can be borrowed, to a large extent depending on the various social linguistic parameters. So we have this big project, the World Loanword Database, and uh, uh, there you, you have uh, the scales of the most borrowable and the least borrowable words. So he and she will be the least borrowable words, and uh, where can be borrowed a little bit more frequently, fire even more frequently, but coffee, machine, motor, and perestroika they don't have, but <laughs> that will be a very easily borrowed borrowable term. So when it comes to borrowed words, people have been discussing for decades differences in borrowability. So different parts of the lexicon differ in their propensity to be borrowed, depending on the lexical category of the word, nouns, verbs, prepositions, all that, depending on their semantic class. We're talking about body parts or we are talking about uh, mm, religious products, depending on the context situation. Uh, so there's a lot of research and a lot of um, generalizations. So knowing this with this um, in mind, we can also use borrowed words as um, uh, a tool for reconstructing the, hist the history and the social linguistic parameters in the context situation. So yeah, so this is the, my, one of my favorite examples. So sister and navel belong to the 400 least borrowable items in this uh, database, but they have been borrowed from inter Finnic languages, from the Baltic languages. So in Finnish, navel is Napa, and in Latvian it's Naba. Cesar is uh, sister for Finnish, and uh, uh, Lithuanian Sesua is sister. So when you see examples like that, uh, there's something odd that happened there, and this is an additional evidence for extensive, extensive bilingual areas with mixed proto finnic baltic marriages. Oh, uh, but let's say this is a little bit, you can't see it, so I have to diminish. But there are also many examples that all of you are familiar with of hidden borrowing. So you have things which have been called calking, loan translations, uh, polysemy calking like uh, French souris, Swedish, uh, not Swedish mouse, moves. Uh, Russian mush, both mean a small mammal and a small handheld device, which is not a very um, mm, surprising thing because uh, this is a calk, calk from English. Then you have things like lexiconstructional calking. In French, you have chemin de fer. Uh, in German, Eisenbahn, uh, Russian, Zhelezne Daroga, Swedish, Jan, Weg, the same, absolutely the same model. So this had been calked. And there are several versions of that, by the, by the way, uh, quite interesting. But uh, in the Russian and Swedish and German, uh, and um, mm, yeah, so this is the same model. And then you have also lots of shared formulaic expressions. So in French, you can say, je t'ai de père le cochon. Uh, in English, to cast pills, pearls before swine. Russian, mitat biser pirisvinyemi, Swedish, at kasta pallor for swine. Exactly the same formulaic expression. Again, it's not a coincidence that it's shared by many languages because this is a an example of hidden borrowing, so a calc or um, spreading of a, of a formula from one among languages. So people who work on contact, Linguistics, aerial linguistics talk 
about the different versions of this opposition, but you can talk about replication of meta and replication of patterns. So here's the quote from a book by Jaron Matras and Jeanette uh, uh, Sarkel. As I don't know how to pronounce your name, by the way. Uh, so um, contact-induced language change can lead to direct replication of morphemes and phonological shapes from a source languages, language. We shall refer to this as replication of linguistic matter substance. Um, but uh, language contact can also lead to reshaping of language internal structures. In the latter process, the formal substance or matter is not imported, but is taken from the inherited stock of forms of the recipient or replica language. Rather, it's the patterns of distribution of grammatical and semantic meaning and of formal syntactic arrangements in various levels uh, that are modeled on an external source. We call this pattern replication. So uh, today we will be talking about pattern replication. And um, uh, it's quite interesting because uh, there's very little general on context semantics, on what happens with semantics when languages come in context. So I quote here uh, um, it's a quote that comes from a uh, chapter on semantics in, uh, in, um, by Felix Amek and David Wilkins. Well, it's thir almost 30 years ago. Uh, it's a chapter in um, the Handbook of Contact Linguistic. And uh, they say, unfortunately, there's no single work, book, chapter, or article which deals with contact semantics in its own right. So semantics typically does not show up as an entry in the indexes of general textbooks dealing with contact issues. The topics, concepts, and observations that have been gathered together here are typically scattered throughout books under such topics as the psychology of bilingualism, lexical borrowing, morphological transfer, social factors, and so on and so forth. So it's time to do something to this. And uh, so um, uh, this is this. Uh, uh, pa um, growing field, I hope it's growing, uh, which we can call aerial lexical semantics. And uh, this has to do with diffusion of semantic features across language boundaries in a geographical area. And um, uh, part of what I will be talking about uh, today comes from a chapter by uh, Hendrik Lillegren and myself, Lexical Semantics and Aerial ling ling Linguistics in the Cambridge Handbook of Aerial Linguistics, uh, where we try to uh, um, give our view of what can be subsumed um, under this um, um, heading of uh, aerial semantics, especially aerial lexical semantics. But of course, uh, there are some predecessors. So there's a, um, a lovely paper by James Mattisoff, Aerial Semantics, Is There Such a Thing? Where he mainly talked about Southeast Asia, but um, uh, not only. And uh, uh, as opposed to me, he's a person who knows very many languages. So. So he just uh, collects these things from his head, I guess. Uh, and then, of course, uh, there was this uh, fantastic project mm, uh, headed by uh, Martin Anov many years ago, which collected people from Lacan and from other places uh, in, in France, uh, which resulted in the book From Polysemy to Semantic Change. So it um, paved the way to, to lot, uh, of a lot of thinking within aerial lexical semantics. And I will also talk quite a lot about this mm, brand new uh, issue of linguistic typology. Uh, so um, uh, the second issue of, of this year, uh, a special issue on aerial typology of lexical semantics, which uh, is edited by myself, Antoinette Schepper, also uh, here, but not here, and Felix Emiko. So, uh, right. So what can be meant by aerial lexical semantics? What kinds of phenomena, what kinds of, um, yes, phenomena that can be covered here? Um, uh, so um, uh, we, it, it can be understood very, very broadly, so I won't be able to cover all the different angles that they are. And it's, since it's a growing discipline or a field, you can um, invent all kinds of interesting things, and uh, I will be happy to discuss these possible directions. So it's huge. It can be from the convergence of individual lexemes through the structuring of entire semantic domains to the organization of entire lexicons. And here, as always in contact linguistics, we can ask these two questions or look at this from two different perspectives. What are the possible outcomes of language contact in the realm of the lexicon? 
and to what extent is it possible to use lexical phenomena for reconstructing contact. So okay, so let's start uh, uh, with uh, you will be massively quoted. Yes. <laughs> uh, Let's start with the overview of the things that I will be talking about, the, the, kin the kinds of phenomena. So I will be talking about lexicosemantic parallels, which um, subsume polysemic calking or sharing and lexicoconstructional calking sharing. I'll be talking about shared formulaic expressions, and I will be talking about area-specific lexicalizations and the shared or similar-looking internal organization of certain semantic domains. Uh, so let's start with polysemic calking, sharing. I gave you this example of mouse. Um, so there are lots of terms for that, and the whole terminological mm, field is a mess in a way. So semantic borrowing, semantic loan, semantic shifts, loan synonyms. We have here examples, an example from um, the word, the Spanish verde and acatec, um, emaya, yash. Um, in the speech of Akatec Spanish bilinguals. So um, in Spanish, uh, uh, verde means both green and unripe, and yash means both green and unripe, but also raw. So in the speech of, uh, uh, in, the, in the Spanish and in the Akatec um, um, speech of these bilinguals, both words have the same polysemy. So, so verde has been extended to, uh, to get this new um, uh, sense. And uh, all these examples just abound in literature. But you also, and in this case, we know, um, we know the model. We, we know where the model comes from. We know that it comes from Akatek. Uh, but in many cases, we notice that there are these, the same polysemy patterns across many languages, several languages, but we don't know we don't know the source. So we have here examples like draw water, copy, imitate in the languages of Ethiopia, Eritrea, um, coming from Hayward. Um, child and fruit in many languages in West Africa, but not only here. Eat and drink, massively the same, the same word in many Papuan and Australian Aboriginal languages, but not also there. So you have this something which looks like polysemy sharing. Well, the problem of whether it's polysemy or the same, the same meaning, it's very, very tricky, so we won't go into there. Alex is already happy. Okay, so <laughs> then we have lexical constructional parallels. Mm, lexical constructional parallels, parallels. And here I have an example from, can you see? Yes, can you see it? Singlish, so the, um, how would they say? Well, the English spoken in Singapore, but not uh, well, the, um, very colloquial, and uh, well, you can say all kinds of things there. So, um, um, in um, uh, Mandarin, in the local Mandarin, uh, eat salt can mean suffer or a bitter or serious setback. Uh, give face. Um, show due respect for one's feelings, so lo lots of things. And people speaking Mandarin tell me that this is not correct, but it's the local version. <laughs> it's the local version of Mandarin. Or do you recognize this? Yeah, but in, 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 in the Singaporean Mandarin, it seems to be. Uh, quite normal. So what you have here is you have these two local words, eat and salt, and uh, uh, you combine them in English in the same way and get the same non-compositional meaning, suffer a bit a serious setback. So here you have, yes, Isabel. You recognize it or? No, 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 okay, yes. But I mean, I, my Chinese uh, listeners, they always comment this, but then I checked with people who work on, on Singaporean Mandarin, and they say that, that that's where it comes from. Mm -hmm. uh, all right, so here again we see the model. Like Maybe the it's a calc from another language. It might be a calc from another language, yes. Mm -hmm. Right, yes. Uh, so we don't know that. But uh, in this immediate example, we see that it's, it's OK in the local Mandarin, and it has been copied to English, to Singlish. So here again we have a model, and we, have, we know where it comes from, but in many other 
in many, many, many situations, we have exact, the exact copies of constructions um, and we just don't know uh, where they come from. So they're shared by many languages. So one of the examples is this sun, which is eye of the day, a shared compounding pattern in mainland Southeast Asia and parts of Oceania. Uh, something? No, OK. Uh, people, man plus woman, a shared compounding pattern in the languages of New Guinea, uh, which is uh, present ev everywhere there. To obey someone, to follow someone's mouth. So the example uh, mentioned by uh, Malcolm Ross. Uh, so in the languages, uh, a shared collocational pattern in the languages of Karkar Island, Papua New Guinea in many different languages. So you have lots and lots of these examples. Uh, so here again, I mean, it's another, another diagram for Tokpisin and East Keva. Men, woman, man, woman, that get people. And I mentioned similar examples last time when I talked about um, um, uh, how you get animal. What was it, pig and dog or something in Papuan languages. So that, that this kind of compound for uh, having a more generic or hyperonym um, word is, is very common in, in those languages. All right, so in all these cases we have, we can talk about semantic associations. And this is the term that was used in Martin's project, I think. So uh, we have lexicosemantic parallels, polysemic calking, uh, lexicoconstructional calking, but there's no strict borderline. So you will see in some languages you use the same word for fruit and child. In other languages you say fruit is child of the tree. And then in other languages you say fruit can be just child or child of the tree. So it's, it's really things that that um, come and go here. Uh, so in all these cases, there's a semantic association between child and fruit. Uh, and um, Alex came up with this uh, uh, wonderful term, colexification, which has become a very popular term. So colexification, as you probably all know, uh, it's the expression of two supposedly different concepts within one word with no strict ideas about whether they are really different or not. But concepts that are expressed in two different, by two different words in one language and are expressed by the same word in another language, you can say that they are collexified. Uh, so uh, this, it's a major advantage of this term is that it's non-committal with respect to why two concepts are expressed with the same linguistic element or not. And, uh, uh, and um, in Alex's um, uh, original work, uh, you talked about strict collexification and loose collexification. So strict collexification is where you have exactly the same word. So if you have child and fruit, this is collexification, strict collexification. But you also talked about loose collexification. So, so child of the tree for fruit will be also collexification, but loose collexification. Because in addition to, to to child, you use something else. It can be compounds, it can be derivation, it can be historical things. So it's, uh, it's more general than the way this word has been become to be used now. And this massive uh, current research on collexification has become very popular, uh, as we will see. All right. So, uh, so these were examples of these lexical constructional patterns and um, uh, um, common polysemy patterns. Uh, then there are these shared formulaic expressions, uh, conventionalized formulaic expressions used for particular pragmatic functions like greetings, curses, proverbs. It's a special case among shared lexical constructional patterns because it's more than just two or three words. It can be longer than that. And we have these familiar farewell expressions, au revoir, au fidusin, pour and do svidania, nekimin. So exactly the same model in many European languages which is the same formula and uh, for, the, for the same pragmatic function. Uh, these are very interesting and people note them occasionally for different parts of the world. So I'll just briefly mention a few examples. So Felix Amica talks about these, these kinds of expressions in several publications. So these um, similar expressions in the languages of Walter Basin, well, they're genetically related because they're all of them are um, qua. Uh, but, uh, but still, uh, so this is um, pre-closing requests. So if you want to, if you are 
uh, at someone's place, then you just want to leave. You can't say farewell or au revoir. Au revoir. You have to ask for permission to leave. So you say something like, I ask for the road. I beg road. And this is the same pattern. Or this is my favorite. Um, so expressions of extreme gratitude in the languages of Walter Basin. Uh, you say, when I die, don't cry. Uh, people working on African languages, or you perhaps recognize this, I don't know. You don't, you know. So <laughs> this is interesting. So, so the idea is that um, um, when someone dies, there's this big hu funeral which uh, lasts for three days. And at least on the first day, you have to cry. Everyone has to express their feelings in a very uh, outspoken way. If you don't cry, something is wrong. Perhaps you wanted this person to die. <laughs> Perhaps you even killed this person. <laughs> but um, let's say if... Uh, uh, so Yvonne has saved me at some point. Perhaps you gave me food when I was starving. And everyone knows about that. So when I die, you don't have to cry. Because everyone knows already that you have done so much for me. You're clean. <laughs> so, so, so I'm so grateful, yes. <laughs> you know, this, this kind of image, I really like this example. Well, and there are lots of other things. So there's uh, work by Lupke and Watson on Jolla languages how they copy, they have this formulaic couplet translatable as, is there peace, peace only, greetings. And uh, again, these are closely related languages, but what happens there is that you have the same uh, phonological material for the first part. So peace will be the same word, uh, but then only will be in the local languages. Uh, and uh, so it's a combination of you, you show your Jola, um, uh, um, identity, but also you, sh you show this emblematic for where, where you are. Uh, but these are anecdotic, um, and uh, Hayward, of course, uh, in an example from the Ethio Eritrean area, die is expressed as eat earth. And he gave this example from Amharic, Oromo, and Gamo, and uh, even... Um, eat soil. Huh? Eat soil. Yes. Soil. <laughs> uh, it's so, uh, yes. It's okay. Soil and earth is the same word in German. Yes. That's why I translated it wrong. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so okay. Yes. Soil. Yes. And I. Yes. <laughs> right. Uh, yes. <laughs> right. Yes. Yeah. Because in the article it eats soil. Yeah, right. It, yes. Yeah, okay. Yes. Soil, yes. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> yes. Okay. Well, we. Yes. Well. Okay. You. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, yes. So, but this is a, a sort of anecdotal evidence like some languages here and there, it's very interesting. But um, there are also a few uh, works, not very much, but some works that look at this um, more systematically. Uh, so I wanted to give you this example. It's, um, it was a project on European phraseologisms uh, led from Helsinki by Elisabeth P. Reinen. She died, unfortunately, a few years ago. So she, it was a huge um, uh, group of researchers coming from different langu language, well, language backgrounds, different countries. So all in all, there were 73 linguistic varieties spoken in Europe, 70 non-European languages, and Esperanto. And uh, so people tried to come up with uh, phraseologism. So these are proverbs, uh, greetings, things like that. And uh, they uh, compared them systematically across these languages. And in the end, there were 380 widespread European phraseologists, quite a lot. Uh, and the leaders, they were night and day to be to fight like cat and dog, to be someone's right hand, to play with fire, to take someone's under one's wings, and to tear or pull one's hair out. Of course, the first one, night and day, you think it's very transparent, but it seems to be more, well, restricted to this European area, uh, which is um, understood a little bit, um, it, well, it, 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 it also subsumes uh, Near East in a way, because it's the same cultural area. Uh, to be fight like cat and dog, um, interesting. So, Eba, do you have a correspondence to this in uh, like Oromo? Or you know what it means to, to be like cat and dog. Mm -hmm. Yes. So what would you say? Is it the same image or...? Uh, no. 
Mm -hmm. Instead, it's a kind of uh, cat and chicken. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Like mm -hmm. they, they, they are the ones which are commonly used mm -hmm. during exhibitions. Mm -hmm. Yes, in Ghana, I asked my students, and they said it was a, a um, what was it? A cat, a cat and a mouse. Mm -hmm. And it's a little bit different because cat and dog, they are sort of equally strong, but they, they start fighting, so you have to keep them apart. Whereas a cat and chicken and cat and mouse, a uh, cat will just uh, get is stronger, but still they try to be uh, apart from, from each other. So this is quite interesting, and uh, in this case, they could also, these researchers, they could analyze the source for this common fra phraseologism. So, a text of ancient writers, the Bible, post-classical literature, proverbial units of medieval and Reformation times, and fables, tales, and legends. So, so strengthening this uh, idea of Europe in an extended sense as a common mm, cultural sphere. Were those phrases always shared throughout Europe, or some only between French and German, or German? Uh, so these, uh, this, what you have in the parentheses, so 69, night and day, this is 69 of the 73 European varieties. So that's what I mean. So to be like cat and dog, 68 of the 73, and not found outside of this area. This is interesting, isn't it? <laughs> so, <laughs> all right. Uh, then there's this um, interesting project. Um, um, there's something which is called the Atlas of, um, a typological atlas of the languages of Dagestan, which uh, um, is, um, um, was a project in Moscow at the High School of Economics. Um, I think they have 24 or something chapters published by now. Uh, and one of the chapters is about greetings morning greetings in the Dagestanian languages. So you basically have two uh, models. One is uh, to say, did you wake up? <laughs> uh, which remind me, reminds me, in, uh, it's very common, at least in my family, to say, um, have you slept well in the morning? You see someone, have you slept well? Uh, and uh, I asked my grandson, have you waked up well? So it's because, <laughs> well, anyway, so, so one of the models is this, have you, um, did you wake up? And in some languages, this has been extended to the general greeting, hello. And this is typical, so it's different groups of Dagestani languages, but it's typical of the area where Avar is a big language, has been the lingua franca, but not limited to it. And the other model is good morning. And there are two subtype, subtypes. One is a combination of morning and good, both words borrowed from Arabic. So something like sabah khair. And the second one is a wish construction, may your morning be good. And they also have aerial distribution, not always clear uh, what, what the um, underpinning of this is. Uh, so the formal appearance and the lexemes involved are diverse and language specific. Mm, it's, it's quite ambitious, and uh, uh, the same group started on a much bigger project, how you express wishes in the languages of Dagestan, which has a lot of uh, various methodological problems, how exactly you define what you're talking about and at which occasions, and it's a very labor-intensive work, so you have to have speakers of this language, students, uh, and unfortunately there will probably not be any future because uh, uh, because of the war. Uh, so the person in charge of the lab, lab, lab Nina Dobrushina, is now in Lyon or Tübingen, and many people have left, and uh, you, it's unclear what's going to happen. I mean, that's, let's say, that's not the worst thing about this war, but uh, the project will probably not be able to continue. So, but I think it, it's interesting, like, as a model for what you can do for various areas, especially if you can engage students. Um, they can collect this. I mean, it, pe people are normally, they get very amused when you start talking about this. So I think it's a, various projects of this kind for, uh, for student groups. But still, in, in this case, it's still just uh, uh, restricted to one area. So the Dagestan uh, area, it's not um, 
it's not a comparison with anything outside of the area. Uh, a slightly, or much more <laughs> ambitious in a way, uh, project is, um, mm, is a chapter by David Gill, who looked at um, greetings which are expressed as where greetings. So here we have Vietnamese, Jakarta, Indonesia, and Iha. Uh, so when you greet someone, you say, where are you going? Where are you going? Where are you going? And David collected data from very many languages. This was simple. I think he just posted questions of this kind on various lists, and he got the results. It's not, um, in many parts of the world, you have some kind of greeting with where do you come from, uh, where are you going, where are you, but it's perhaps not as formalized as in this particular region. So you here you see that they have uh, di directional conventionalized greetings with where, uh, then you have yellow non-directional non conventionalized greetings with where, so where you are, where are you now, and then where you don't have conventionalized greetings with where. And this is, uh, so, so for David Gill, this is an, an evidence, an additional ev evidence for a huge linguistic area, Mekong, Mamberamo linguistic area. So these kinds of things. You're having a good time there, can you? Claire? <laughs> <laughs> Claire and Alex, are you? We have the same two, no, I, I was asking if she Yes, it's, it's, she but it's, it's part of the same area. Yeah, yeah. And there are all kinds of interesting things there because, uh, well, perhaps you just don't greet people all the time. Perhaps you just greet them when they are coming or going. Mm -hmm. So I had this discussion with Hendrik Lilligren, my so co-author, in Hindukush. I mean, it, it's, it's a mountainous uh, uh, place. Uh, so you, you, the, all these people you meet all the time and you probably don't greet them. And then you see someone new and you ask, where are you coming from or where are you going? That's, so so it, it, I think it's, it, the semantics and the pragmatics of these expressions can be elaborated on. When I was in the field, everybody would ask, you know, where are you going mm -hmm. as a greeting? Mm -hmm. And now it's, I have lots of interaction online. Mm -hmm. So the question now is, where are you? Aha, uh -huh, right, and yes. <laughs> with the same person, when, you know, yes. mm -hmm. I say, well, I'm in France, I was, mm -hmm. uh, just mm -hmm. like yesterday. <laughs> ah, OK. Then, uh, oh, but it's still, so they, they still ask this. Uh, yeah, they still, yes. Like mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's the new greeting. Yes, yes. Okay. So, um, and then the last um, um, group of phenomena, it's area-specific lexicalizations or area-specific um, categorizations of different domains. So, so the first thing is concepts that are lexicalized across languages in a particular area, but strike outsiders as very specific and curious. Well. We all know these concepts occasionally. Well, French is the only word, you know, language in the world that has a word for what, what can it be? I don't know. Uh, or <laughs> <laughs> Swedish is the only language in the world that has a word lagom, lagom, which means, well, not too much, not, yeah, not so yeah well, I mean, you know, th those kinds of things. The example, so bad in Portuguese. Mm -hmm. so yes, all right, yes, so we all know that. But of course, if you if you're from outside see these uh, specific concepts, Concepts in several languages belong to the same area. That do does mean that they have uh, that they have context because they can be shared physical environment. If you have different types of terrain, or you have sheep of different kinds or seasons types of skin, you have to talk about that. Uh, they can be shared material culture, cultural values, and practices, which may but do not have to go hand in hand with language context. So there, these difficult questions. Uh, how to separate language contact from something else. But then you have also more um, linguistically um, oriented um, uh, concepts which uh, where you don't easily connect uh, to the um, surrounding in the same way. So an example given by Metisov in this uh, um, wonderful paper is the aerial semantics, is this um, uh, word um, for uh, a specific feeling or sentiment uh, which can be translated from uh, uh, Jingpo, Thai, Burmese, uh, Japanese, and many other languages. So to be deterred by feeling of respect, embarrassment, fear of offending, be generally restrained in one's per interpersonal behavior by the knowledge that self-assertiveness is not socially approved. And he connects it to 
uh, he explained is that reflecting a mindset more typical of the Southeast Asian region than the more aggressive interpersonal ideal in Western competitive societies. Well, there's a, a parallel in the Scandinavian culture. Uh, so uh, Western competitive societies can be understood in various ways. Uh, uh, so this was an example of a particular uh, lexicalization that is shared by languages um, um, of the same area. You can also have examples of um, similar lexicalizations within more universal semantic domains, like the example um, again given by, by Hayward, where you have dry enough for use as a specific word, or the, the example that you also quoted, borrowing something to be returned in kind, or borrowing something which is itself to be returned. So for some people, uh, if you borrow a book at the library <laughs> and you return it, um, it will be the second. For some people, it's the first one, because you lose the book and then you have to replace <laughs> it <laughs> with a similar one. Um, or you have. Um, Examples from uh, quoted by or uh, described by Marianne Mithun in this in her um, recent paper uh, that languages in uh, California, uh, many of them distinguish systematically in their in their verbs. They distinguish such features as the number, animacy, shape, consistency of their most immediately involved participants as an inherent part of the meaning of verbs denoting position, movement, handling, dying, and killing, and more. So we'll have different verbs for carry a person, carry a light object, carry two objects, carry long objects, carry several objects, carry things lying in a mass, carry things standing up as wood in a burden basket. So these, uh, these um, uh, specific uh, sp specializations, they're not exactly the same across these languages, but they are quite, they have share similarities, so, uh, yeah, right. Um, now, if we talk about shared organization of whole semantic domains, it's very tricky. So if you have uh, exactly the same uh, organization of um, semantic domains across languages, the best examples come from um, um, lexical domains that mm, are very close to grammar, so closed, um, uh, domains with very few uh, members, very few uh, words. So uh, Johann van der Wauwera uh, in the Eurotype project he had this paper study of phasal adverbs like still, no longer, not yet, already. Uh, so how you cover up this uh, domain of polarity, mm, phasal polarity, and he showed that Europe, mm, many languages in Europe uh, could be, um, they, they were, uh, they showed patterns that were not uh, very frequent outside of Europe. And also in, in Europe, you could have different aerial patterns. Another example here is also an old study by David de Ricca on deictic verbs, like languages in Europe again. So if you have this opposition between come and go, and he showed aerial differences here. Um, uh, I have here an example of calendrical expressions in the Hindakush languages where you have uh, specific words for not only today, yesterday, tomorrow, but the day before yesterday, or three days ago, the day after tomorrow, three days hence, which are not compositional and not transparent. So the languages of this area, they have this kind of organization. So again, this is a pretty close domain. When you leave that and try to talk about more open domains, uh, colors and perception and uh, temperature and all that, things beca become much more complicated. So my feeling is that um, semantic systems change so quickly. I will talk about this next time when I talk about temperature in the Slavic languages. So even closely related languages, if you, if the, even if they have cognates, they develop uh, very quickly new meanings and extend their meaning. So just if you want to see mm, a shared organization of a semantic domain, of a whole semantic domain, 
in a whole area, that will be very, very, very difficult to find good examples. But you can talk about this in a milder version. So again, going back to Matisov, he says that the Southeast Asian lexico-semantic aerial features include a rich lexicon of verbs of manipulation within such domains as carrying or cutting. So there will be very many words there as compared to other languages where you perhaps just have one word for carry or one word for cut. Uh, and this has to be checked for cutting. There's some research, not so much. Uh, for carrying, I, I, give you an ex I give you a map from um, mm, the unpublished manuscript by uh, Bernhard Welchli, Motion Events and Parallel Texts, where he shows, so it was, uh, it's, it's based on, uh, uh, on uh, biblic texts. So, uh, um, and um, uh, there are lots of places there in the verses where people carry something. And these are, exa these are translations into several hundred languages. And what you see here in this map is that many languages just have one verb, carry. So these are yellow. Uh, then you have, uh, um, well, several languages in Africa, and this is much more frequent there, have a special verb for carry on head because that's what you very often do. And then you have um, languages where you have body parts, specific carry verbs. So there will be different verbs for carry on head, carry on arms, carry on shoulders, carry on back. Uh, <laughs> yeah, like a collar. Yes, well, uh, well, probably yes. And this is Southeast Asia, basically, not only there. So, so this is an interesting fact. All right, so, so these were examples of these different uh, um, directions, so to say, into what can be meant by aerial lexico-semantics, kinds of phenomena. Um, and um, now there are various questions. So how do we discover these patterns? Uh, which is very complicated. So of course, we can stumble upon them, start with observations. And I think that's what many people do, like Hayward for Ethiopia and uh, Matisov uh, and many other people. We can also start with the list of concepts, situations, and collecting systematic gross linguistic data, like we very often do in typology in general. So grammatical typology, OK, I, I have this concept, and I try to figure out how this is expressed in different languages. And I hope to find something interesting, aerial or genetic. You can start with a hypothesis and then check it. Or you can also use big data parallel corporate and lexical databases. Uh, by the way, you can interrupt me at any moment. And uh, we can also have a break if you feel for that. Just tell me. OK? So starting with the list of concepts and collecting systematic cross-linguistic data, so this, this massive work, which I always quote in, on all occasions, um, Matthias Urban's uh, dissertation, which is found online. Analyzability, analyzability and semantic associations in referring expressions, uh, where he asks this question, are there universal tendencies in the realization of certain meanings? Which patterns are rare, only found in some languages? Are there patterns that are peculiar to a certain area? Are there patterns that are peculiar to a certain family? And what he does, so this is about lexical motivation and analyzability. analyzability. So if you have this example of sun, moon, and day, you can have it in, well, in French or in Russian or in English. Sun and moon and day will be three different words. The, so there's no connection. Uh, then you can have association between sun and moon. You can have collexification. Or you can have moon derived from sun. So you can say that these words are analyzable in a way. And moon is motivated by, by the sun. Or you can ha also have association between sun and day. Again, collexification or sun derived from the day, or day derived from the sun. Um, uh, so we said, we, so sun derived from the day, that will be this matahari. Uh, so um, uh, sun, um, eye, of the, eye of the day will be sun. So what Matthias did is, it's a, it's a terribly ambitious enterprise. He had 160 meanings from four different domains topological and nature-related terms, artifacts, body parts and body, body fluids, phases of the day, and miscellaneous, which he checked systematically in 100 languages. And he came up, and this, this is quite interesting, because some of these 
patterns where you com where you um, as associate meanings. They're very very um, very um, frequent. So bark and skin. In many languages, you have the same word, or you this lexical association, or you have uh, feather and hair. So these are interesting, of course. And also you can find some um, associations that are more aerially specific. Uh, so one of them was animal, pig, dog, which I mentioned last time. Uh, bone associated with strong and strength in, in Melanesia or in Papua. Uh, so you can see, uh, I think I've stolen them from, from Matthias at some point. point. We have this recycling of slides. So you see animal is pig, dog. It's basically that region. You don't find it any, anywhere else. And you have bone, strong, and strength again, only in this region. Um, so this is uh, coming from, you just systematically collect data, and you hope that you will find something. Uh, uh, then you can start with the hypothesis. Um, so um, qualification, yes, qualification patterns as I reality indicators. Uh, and uh, we have this paper by Antoinette Shepard, uh, Lila Sandrock, and uh, Rachel Hendry, Tree, Firewood, and Fire in the Languages of Sahul, uh, which was published by a volume that I edited a few years ago, together with Pavi Yuvanen, The Lexical Typology of Semantic Shifts. Uh, so this is a first in-depth survey of lexical expressions for tree, firewood, and fire in 300 Australian and Papuan languages. So Sahul, what is Sahul? <laughs> is an Asian, do you believe in Sahul? Claire and Alex? Yes, okay. Ice uh, age. Huh? During the Ice Age. Yes, the yes. So it's an Asian supercontinent that connected Australia and New Guinea during the last glacial maximum up until around 10,000 years ago. So this connection uh, was in existence during the first migrations of modern humans into the region from 50,000 50, years ago, quite a long time ago. So if you try to reconstruct the genetic connections between the languages in Australia and New Guinea, you won't find anything because it's just too far away, too long ago. So you can start by something else. Well, Papuan languages, uh, there are lots of families there, um, and Australian languages, Pamanyungan family, and then 27 small non-Pamanyungan non, um, non languages. So the pattern that they were looking at is something here which you find in Duna, which is a Papuan language. Now the kangaroo bird lays its eggs in trees, they say. The, bods, the boy said, you must not fetch firewood, the fire burned the land. And you see it's exactly the same word. So firewood, uh, fire, and tree. And this is something that has been noted, that had been noted before, both for Papuan languages and for Australian languages. So for Papuan languages, Laycock um, mentioned that the main conflation to look for here is that of tree and fire by the intervening concept firewood. It is found in Tho, and it's reported to be common in Trans New Guinea phylum languages. And for Australian languages, Dixon uh, had this principle. Some, but by no means all Australian languages, take the principle of having a single term to describe some natural object and also something that can be made from it, to the extreme of having a single lexeme covering both tree, wood, and fire. Mm. Nick Evans mentioned this also. Also, it's, the, it's called the actual potential polysemy, and he says it's ubiquitous in Australian languages. So you have something that gives rise to a product. I mean, we have this with rabbit or with chicken. Mm. A chicken is <laughs> <laughs> but you can also eat chicken, right? Um, which you don't do with cow or with sheep, because you will differentiate between the animal and the meat. Mm -hmm. But you don't this do this with many other things. So, so what what these uh, ladies? Antoinette has a whole hmm? uh, facet. Antoinette Chabert, she also has a whole description of, of that uh, 
reconciliation between them. Yeah, that's what I. That's what I. That's that. That's the chapter that I'm talking about. Yes, yeah, yeah. yeah, so I So, so the la the three uh, the three ladies they looked at very many languages, three hundred languages, and they found that there were several patterns of this coloxification. I won't go into all the details, uh, and uh, how these patterns are. Mm, mm, distributed across both continents, uh, and um, they found that what they found was that um, the most common pattern among these languages is to collectify firewood and fire, but not tree. Uh, but these different patterns appear in various aerial constellations, and uh, those patterns that you find there are cross linguistically very, very uncommon. So full coloxification, tree, firewood, and fire, you find it, but it's, it's restricted. Otherwise, in the languages of the world, you basically don't find it. So it's very, very rare. Uh, so these patterns show a strong aerial skewing towards Sahul. And this um, is also patterns that you find in uh, contact languages. So you have in Creole, uh, the Australian contact language, buyer, fire, or pyre, can be used as fire, firewood, and so on and so forth. So this is a pattern that is present there. And their conclusion is that, well, the former hypothesis that had been uh, suggested by Laycock and by, by Dixon, they are not completely true, because there are many versions of this pattern. But still, there's something there which shows that uh, there are very deep connections between the languages spoken in Australia and Papua New Guinea which you don't find evidence for by other methods. So this is something that can be used for reconstructing this contact. Uh, and then uh, the other direction is using big data. So you, all these, I mean, both Matthias Urbans and this paper, it's, it's a lot of work. It's paid work, right? You have to. Um, uh, browse through dictionaries, you have to uh, exploit your colleagues, and it's a lot and lot and lot of work. <laughs> so, <laughs> so the question is whether you can do it quickly, quicker than that. And um, mm, that's something which is in a way on the rise. Uh, so one um, study mm, also published in the same um, volume on the lexical typology of semantic shifts is by my colleague Robert Erstling, who is a computational linguist, and he also uses parallel text. So he has text in a thousand languages. So translations of the, um, what do you call it in English? Um, Evangelium. Uh, uh? Gospel. gospel, yes, of the gospel. Uh, so he, made, he had a few experiments, and he tried to check whether you could find these aerial uh, patterns in coloxification. So what he did there, it was an experiment where he started with those coloxifications that had been mm, proposed as aerial, so fire, <coughs> <coughs> fire, fire, firewood, an arm and hand, and it turned out that, well, he could find this in, in this parallel corpu corpus. So it's a quick and dirty method which provides a preliminary question to answer to the question where at all does tree fire coloxification occur in a few seconds which may open up interesting and fruitful directions for more careful and time-consuming lexicotypological work. But of course, I mean, not everything pops up in, in the gospel, uh, so you don't have so much material. To Another experiment that uh, uh, was carried out by uh, Volker Gast and myself, mainly by Volker Gast, um, was, um, mm, it's a paper, The Aerial Fact in Lexical Typology, which was published um, in a book, uh, it's a kind of fast read for Johann van der Rauwera. So what we did there, we um, uh, uh, looked at big lexical databases. Um, <coughs> and this was the version of database of cross-linguistic coloxification or clicks, and automatic similarity judgment program. Um, so clicks, so the questions we asked was, were how much information about aerial patterns in lexical typology can be extracted from large-scale cross-linguistic lexical databases? Uh, and more specific, what exactly can we find there? 
so most of you will know about this Clicks database. Uh, the people here who went to the summer school in Fréjus, where we talked about this. So it's a database of coloxifications, uh, and uh, uh, in that data across many languages. Uh, very many languages, and the version that we used at that time had 221 languages. This was the second version, and now I think it's the fourth, so the number of languages has grown. Uh, and there in this database, we only have strict coloxification, so we only have words, exactly the same words that are used for various concepts. So it's, um, it's a complicated method, clustering, pre-processing with Python, quantitative analysis with R and all that, I won't go into details, and uh, um, my knowledge of these things is um, fairly low, but I happen to s collaborate with people who know these things, so that's good. Uh, and yes, we found a few, a few interesting aerial patterns. I won't go into all of them, but one pattern that popped, popped out there is the collectification of stone and mountain. Is it stone or rock? Stone. Stone. Depends on what, what, yes, yes, a stone that you can move. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, that's what, I mean, it's also an interesting question how you define. Mm -hmm. uh, so stone and mountain, and you see that it's, uh, it's very heavy in, um, uh, in Africa, close to the equator. It's very heavy in Australia and in some other places of the world. And if you look at how mountains look like, in this part of the world, <laughs> you see that mountains, that's a big stone. <laughs> it's a very big stone. Uh, and uh, interestingly, um, this has been, it had been earlier um, mentioned by both Matthias Urban, but also before him um, in the Lec dictionary of Bach, you might be familiar, it's a fantastic source. So there's also a certain affinity between mountain and stone in Indo-European languages. So halis, which is rock in some languages and large stone in other. And then you have la Latin colis, which is a hill. So there are these shifts, yes. Uh, and alternatively, in many languages, mountain is col collectified with forest or mountain forests. So even in Latin American Spanish, selva is used not only as forest, but also for fa mountain. Here is an example, Catamarca, Argentina. Looks different. It's a lot of forest. So this is just one example, and we had a few other things. All right, so since then, there have been several uh, studies using big data based on lexical databases. I've said this has become very popular. So it, it, again, in the same uh, issue of linguistic typology, a special issue on, on lexical aerial semantics of lexical, what is it, aerial typology of lexical semantics, we have at least three papers uh, using big data. So there's the paper um, by uh, Georga, Georga Kopoulos, uh, Tanasis, uh, Ethan Grossman, Nikolai, Nikolaev, Dmitry Nikolaev, and Stefan Poli. Universal and macro aerial patterns in the lexicon, a case study in the perception and cognition domain. We have another paper by uh, Volker and myself. Uh, and these are both used uh, based on clicks. And then we have a paper based on reflex, which you have, you are lucky to have here. It's a fantastic resource. So there's a paper by Guillaume Sergerer and uh, Martin, aerial patterns in collectification of color terms in the languages of Africa. And there's a lot coming. Uh, at the summer school in Fréjus, we listened to uh, one of the um, collaborators uh, within this CLICS um, project, um, Annika Chuka, who uh, spoke about her research on body parts and collectifications across domains and some other things. And they're also developing uh, the algorithm there, so you can also look at partial collectifications, which is um, a much more interesting thing in a way. So here's the um, um, table of contents for this special issue. Uh, most of these are found online, open access. Uh, not everything, but most of them. Um, so I, I mentioned, uh, I'll mention, I guess I'll mention all of them. All right, so why is all this interesting? 
I hope you you think it's interesting. I'm I'm fishing for some <laughs> feedback. <laughs> well, <laughs> yes. my last talk, Anton, Anton, Anton telling me, oh, this was rubbish. But this is <laughs> perhaps what have I done? Um, right. Uh, so. Um, Well, uh, of course, this this is fun. In most respects, this is right. But of course, there are uh, <laughs> all this. If you go to all this trouble, uh, there should be some other higher aims, not only having fun. So, of course, this is a tool for historical linguistics, contributing with evidence for or tracing deep time connections between groups and even establishing new areas and adding to the understanding of the broader historical and cultural setting in the area under investigation. So we saw this example of the Sahul area where I, uh, when I said that other, other attempts to unite this um, um, linguistic area has uh, been much less successful. Um, Matthias Urban he has several publications, one of them is on the lexical association for words of words for sun and moon, where you have exactly the same word or very similar words. And it's a very rare phenomena across linguistically, but you find a concentration uh, on a Pacific Rim. So it's an evidence for this uh, Pacific Rim um, area, very old ancient area that had been suggested by Balthazar Bickel and John Nichols. Uh, Mitun, this lexical organization of the basic verbs in Northern California, where you have all this carry this person, no, uh, what was it? We had uh, um, carry one person, carry many persons, carry a little thing, carry a big thing, and all that. Uh, so um, the languages spoken there, there are many families, not of them are, well, most of them are not related, and there's no borrowing, there's no evidence of genetic uh, connections, but these patterns are so um, outstanding, so striking, that they can be used, again, as a tool for reconstructing contact. Um, uh, and um, in the special issue, there are two more papers. So again, by Urban, he is very prominent when it comes to uh, lexical associations and using um, aerial typology of lexical semantics. Uh, so he has his paper is about the words for heart, liver, and lungs in the Andean languages, and he shows that um, the structural relations between these terms in the Quechuan and Barbadoan languages they help to identify a remnant of an earlier contact situation that ceased to exist centuries ago. So if you trace this development, you can come up with interesting scenarios for what could might have happened. Uh, and Henrik Lilligren's uh, paper in the same collection, it's about um, kin terms in the Hindu Kush area. And he shows that there are interesting aerial lexicalization patterns there. So how you talk about your aunts and, uh, and uncles and things like that, which show uh, whether uncles and will be the same, let's say if you have father's uh, brother and mother's brother will be the same word or different will father's brother will be, be the same as father, you know, these kinds of patterns. So he shows very interesting aerial patterns that also um, betray intra-regional differences in marriage patterns and local alliance building. So the area, so it's a gradual process of Islamization. So before Islam, you were not allowed to marry your cousins. With Islam, it's the other way around. So now it's the, 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 bet, the best couple you can. So, so these things can witness uh, of such connections. So it's, it's very interesting for historical reasons. And of course, we can also say that these lexico-semantic uh, parallels are very um, potent, uh, mighty aerality indications, indicators, and it's uh, too bad that there have been very few attempts to use them as um, um, isoglosses for, for strengthening 
linguistic areas. So what we had earlier was uh, Mesoamerica, some attempts for Ethiopia Eritrea, and now in this um, special issue we also have a paper by Lamin Suag on West African Sahel savanna languages. Uh, so uh, for Mesoamerica that was probably the most ambitious attempt to use uh, lexicosymatic parallels as, as aerial indicators. There was a uh, big discussion in the um, 80s, um, a, a very important paper uh, by Campbell, Kaufman and Smith Stark, Mesoamerica as a linguistic area. So they had lots and lots and lots of properties, grammatical, phonological, and all that, trying to show that the languages in, the, in Mesoamerica form a linguistic area. Uh, and um, so there are different, many different features, five were present throughout the area, nominal possession of the type his dog, relational nouns, vigesimal numeral system, and so, so on, and also several widespread semantic calcs. And in that paper, I think that they had like 54. Uh, after that, yes, 52. Smith Stark, one of the authors, co-authors, he tests uh, these lexicosemantic parallels in a much more consistent way. So what he did, and this is pretty good, so he had a sample of 25 genetically and geographically diverse languages from Mesoamerica. Then he had 11 languages on the border to this area. And then five North American and five South American languages well removed from this area. And what he tried, he tested, he had three kinds of parameters to what extent the feature occurs throughout the region, its frequency in Mesoamerica, and its limitation to this area. And by the end of the day, he found that 14 lexicosemantic parallels turn out to be bound to this area, uh, and nine occur in at least four language families. So boar, deer, deer snake, wrist, neck of a hand, mouth, edge, uh, alive, awake, uh, things like that, poor, widow, orphan, marry, fine, and meat, thumb, mother of hand, and finger, child of hand. Uh, now, uh, mother of hand for thumb is also prominent in Southeast Asia, but it's very far away, so it's not, <laughs> otherwise it's not so. Uh, and and uh, later, uh, Cecil Brown um, wrote a paper where he tried to argue that uh, about the decisive role of Nahuatl as lingua franca for carrying out this uh, being, um, well, uh, this motto behind these things. Uh, but so it's it's uh, it hasn't been there, there hasn't been done so much, and uh, um, Yvonne talked a lot about Hayard uh, at this uh, at the summer school that you can go further with what he has suggested, and of course lexicosemantic parallels uh, have a great potential as aerialic indicators because they are very idiosyncratic. You can multiply this and they're logically independent from each other because people trying to argue for linguistic areas, they always have this discussion. Uh, <laughs> is it, how would we say, the, the more the merrier, the more features we have, or you have substantial features, or the features are dependent on each other and all that. But with lexicosemantic parallels, I mean, if you have um, a thumb, which is mother of, the, of hand, it has nothing to do with whatever we, we had. Um, uh, poor, widow, orphan, they are logically completely independent of each other. And it's even, in a way, better with shared formulaic expressions as aeriality indicators, because um, they are non-compositional very often, so chances for similar independent innovation is low. They are, most importantly, they are learned as conversational routines and conventions. So the witness of shared socialization and repeated communication. And often they are, let's say if I can pronounce it, permeated, yes, with the shared cultural scripts and values. So they bear testimony to the shared cultural history of the area. So it's a lot that can be done there. Now, uh, so, so this is the, the historical 
usage of these uh, things. But of course, it's also interesting, these aerial patterns are interesting as a window on the relation between the various factors that shape our conceptualization of the world and its linguistic expression. So some things might be more universal, have to do with things that are rooted in our mm, biology uh, and abilities. Some things have to do with various historical relations between languages and their speakers, environment, cultural practice, and so on. As you know, I mean, I will be talking about this also. Mm, people in cognitive semantics, they talk about universal metaphors, um, universal connections, but normally they have checked like a few languages, but they haven't done much work cross-linguistically. So some of the things that have been suggested that universal conceptualization are perhaps just uh, the limited, limited to one particular area, to one particular family. So doing all these things, we can, if we, if we try to pursue this more systematically, we might gain more understanding of these things. And of course, I mean, these factors that shape our conceptual links or our understanding, that's, that's fun. I mean, I, I showed you this example of uh, uh, stone and mountain, which is environmentally uh, <laughs> uh, linked. Uh, uh, Martin and uh, uh, Guillaume have examples of colors, so yellow, what was it? Um, it's a particular kind of bean, so the distribution of uh, um, languages which have yellow, uh, the same word as a particular bean. It, it is uh, very much reminiscent of the um, area in Africa where, where locusts, right? Locusts, Locus. yes, where they grow. So you can understand the connection. And there's other things like that. So another example that we had here, I'll show you because it's quite funny if I find it. <coughs> yes, so <coughs> one of the, <coughs> another collective execution that Volker and I <coughs> pulled out by the method uh, is the collectification of ear and leaf. And, and it seems to be again, uh, very massive in Eastern Africa. And it seems that um, uh, it's, um, it's a particularly common pattern in Eastern Africa, most of the languages being located in Gildeman's Nilotic Ceramic Spread Zone. I don't know if you people believe in these things, but, well, on the know about this, but <laughs> it's languages coming from different families, but it's this particular area. And in one of the sources for, for the words, um, so this grammar says for Sheko that, um, or the dictionary high is ear and then leaf of ensete or yam. So it specifies what leaf it is. And if you look at how it looks like, these are ears. It's not, con it's not connected to the shape. It's not connected, no, it's con connected to something else. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, ears. In, you have uh, some languages in Ethiopia that have ear for uh, usable leaf, le leaves that have a use and mm -hmm. that are eaten or consumed. Okay, and these are not. No, they are. Mm -hmm. So these are useful leaves. So useful leaves are ears and other... other ah, all right, all right, yes. But, no. but, but anyway, so, so, but the shape is important, right? No. Because they the look like... Mm -hmm. huh? No, the function. The shape is uh, the shape is not important. Yes, but all right. Anyway, we can t <laughs> we can talk it about it. Look like Mr. Spock's ears. Yeah. Sorry, <laughs> sorry. Okay, all right. <laughs> okay, but uh, well, it was it it was a brave um, idea. Uh, okay, so going back. Um, anyway, and then of course, where were we here? Um, then also adding these patterns. Um, Mm, to the discussion of contact phenomena is interesting because, uh, uh, as I said in the beginning, there's a lot of work done on borrowability, uh, and that's more or less borrowability of uh, its matter, borrowability when it comes to words, so which words you, uh, you borrow. Uh, there's also a separate discussion in uh, grammatical typology about some things that can be borrowed, gender is normally not borrowed, word order is borrowed, you know, these kinds of things. So, but these are separate discussions. Uh, so there are all these uh, hierarchies, one of them is here. Uh, so what you borrow, 
you start with nouns and then you end up with subordinating conjunctions and uh, the various versions. But borrowing, as I've said, they have mostly been formulated for material transfer. Uh, relatively little has been suggested on the potential ordering within pattern replication and on direct transfer of phonetics phonology. So this is looking at this, um, um, what, what happens with um, pattern um, borrowability spreading is interesting. So under what circumstances you can borrow patterns? Is there any uh, um, aeriki as to what is borrowed first uh, and second? And uh, it's, uh, there's a lot of uh, things that we don't know. But uh, again, in this special issue, um, the two papers that touch upon this, so one is by Volker Gaston and myself. Uh, where we use clicks and zoom into Europe because this is the, the region where you have most uh, um, data points. And we try to figure out whether you can predict or uh, contest some hypothesis on what is borrowed in the realm of nuclear vocabulary and uh, the basic, well, very frequent, frequent words. Uh, is it mm, easier to borrow words or is it easier to borrow um, the collectification patterns. So we have we, the various tests and we have come, come up with some ideas. And also Lamine Swag uh, has this case study of Korangie. And he suggests that borrowing of lexemes in the basic vocabulary may be slower than semantic calking in basic vocabulary. But it's just, just this, the start of all these studies. And what we also noticed when we worked with clicks is that the data are so dirty. It's very difficult to, uh, yes. So you can come up with some hypothesis, but uh, it's really not, not enough. So um, do you want me to stop, or should I go on? <laughs> My time is up. I was I was t told to be to that I have two hours. Okay. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, I can stop at any moment, but uh, before stopping, because what I wanted to do now is to discuss the methodological reflections. Well, the the more you talk, the less time there is for discussion. Yes. Usual, I think, so if you look here. Methodological reflections, advantages and disadvantages of the different methods. Click to add text. So no, that you see, click to add text. <laughs> because <laughs> I thought that it's time to, to have some kind of discussion. What do you think about all these things that I've said? And also how, um, I mean, what can be done? Uh, do you yourself see? Problems, advantages. Uh, do you want me to say a few words, or do you just want to raise any problems, any challenges, any whatever? Maybe you should first say, as an expert, you should say a few words, and then we can chip in right? our ideas. Okay. Uh, so just a few. I mean, oh, there's one problem that pops up all the time, and this is the problem of separating universal genetic and aerial phenomena. And we know it from other places and from grammatical typology. We are sort of used for, for, for working there with these things. And uh, this is one, one example of uh, uh, the link between perception and cognition that you all know about. So uh, there was this suggestion by Yves Switzer that there's a universal link between vision and cognition because we have things like, can you see what I mean? And this is what you can trace in Indo-European languages, whereas for, for audition, it will be something different. For an audition, if you hear something, it will be obey and all that. So she said that there's a universal link from vision to cognition, and audition will be something else. And then there was a paper by Nick Evans and David Wilkins, where we looked at the Aboriginal Australian languages, and they found the link between hearing and cognition, and nothing between vision and cognition. And their um, conclusion was that, well, vision and cognition is perhaps universal connected, but there's something special with the Australian Aboriginal languages, various factors. Then Martin Manov had another study, which was a balanced sample, 25 languages. And she came up with the 
a conclusion that, well, hearing and cognition are much more universally connected. It's not only Aboriginals that have this connection, but it's, it's found everywhere. Uh, so it's a very strong typological tendency. Vision and cognition, also very strong, but not universal. And it went on like that. Then there was a paper by Laila Sandrock and s several others, and the paper by uh, Thanasis Georgakopoulos and the others in our, um, in our uh, special collection, where they look at many languages, uh, especially in, in the letter, when they look at the clicks, and uh, they analyze that data in various ways and find that both hearing, from hearing to cognition, from vision to cognition, are widespread across the world. But there can be some error pen. So that's an in, I think it's a very in, interesting, instructive um, example where you first start with something which is universal, then you find something where you say, well, it's still universal, but this is aerial. Then the next one is, no, this is not a aerial, this is universal. And the first one was aerial, and then you find out that both are, you know. So, so this is the general thing that we have all the time. And um, so the method that seems to work in aerial studies and aerial typology and seems to work here is that you have a combination of uh, macro and micro typology. You zoom in and zoom out into various phenomena because uh, uh, you can, starting with a very broad sample, you might discover something, but then you have to look attentively at particular region for understanding whether this is really frequent there, whether there's something which, which, uh, which happens there or not. Uh, so, so this is the kind of method. It's, it's very time consuming, but uh, there are examples. So we, I, I mention Urban all the time because he's really a leading expert here. So I mentioned this example of um, sun as eye of day uh, and uh, universal from a cross linguistic, uh, from the global perspective, it's very unusual. Uh, so it's, it's found in this, in this region. Then he zoomed in and collected very many languages from this region and discovered that this was pretty, pretty frequent there. Uh, so his idea was that, well, it is um, mainly Southeast Asian Oceanic, Oceania, but he was also attacked by Blast, who said that, well, it's much more cross-linguistically frequent at all. So, so I mean, these, these are these things that you have to look at different sub-samples, uh, different methods, and combine them um, probably to come up with the best result. Uh, and then the, the method that I talked about, so mm, the big data, um, uh, whatever, what, um, yeah, um, qualification and all that, um, of course, there. If you have to do all this manually to collect all this data, it's it's very it's huge. Uh, but with with the big data, um, it's very often it's dirty. Uh, you you are just um, restricted to uh, what you have there. So in the parallel text, as I said, I mean not people don't talk about everything in the gospel. Uh, or in the clicks in those big databases, it's collectification, strict collectification. So you just look for uh, the same word that expresses two meanings. And this is not all. First you have these constructions, then you have derivations, and you can also have the same meaning which is spread over a whole construction, and you don't find this, this uh, in, in these databases. So you just have a sub-portion of interesting things that you can um, uh, that um, witness of a common semantic pattern um, in an area. So this is what I wanted to say, basically. So just go ahead. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe if I'd, I'd just like to say it, it's also difficult. I mean, even with the best possible database, so even the cleanest database you have, with one, one other issue with that is you don't have negative evidence. Mm -hmm. And this is often very crucial to sure. determine an, an area. And I, I recall that um, Lamine, uh, yeah, I mean, when he worked on his paper, this, twin, uh, this paper on Kurange and the, and the contact across the Sahel, 
that uh, yeah, well, he explained how difficult it was for him to get uh, negative data and that he had to eliminate many parameters because uh, yeah, they, it, it was not possible. Mm -hmm. So this would require even, uh, yeah, you can only just distribute questionnaires and hope that somebody can answer them. Yeah. Yes. Should I stop screen sharing? Uh, yeah. Maybe then I can then I can um, show all the participants. If you yeah, I think it's sharing. it's better, right? Okay. No, it's mm -hmm. okay. Mm -hmm. Oh, I have people here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If anybody also online, if anybody else has questions, so then maybe one should say it so that maybe people can ask. Questions. Uh, yeah. Are there questions online? No. Questions, comments in the audience? <laughs> you, you see this better. Than yes, I'm <laughs> looking at myself as all, always. I mean, <laughs> that's the problem with Zoom. <laughs> you always focus on yourself, so I, have, I hide self view. And just a small remark about, I mean, the, the, when you, this example, uh, uh, stone and stone and mountain, so it's, I mean, the, the remark more is about like, Using how do you defining a concept so, and also when you do like mass comparison because this was an example of mass comparison. So most of these languages in, in northern Sub-Saharan Africa, the Sahel zone, so there, there are just no mountains there. So the and the you would not use English word mountain to most of these things. So you also in the picture that you saw somewhere called Asso Rock and mm -hmm. whatever. So mm -hmm. and so basically what and when you do have different terms, so basically these words stone will be used for when you say rock in English, so, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and so when and the question is, when you say there is a like this qualification between stone and mountain, so it's when people are forced to name something what they never seen or they don't have normally in the culture in the surroundings, so then they would just choose one term. But does it mean that like the qualification or how valid is this mm -hmm. observation? If it would, it would be probably more valid if you would find something like this in areas where you do have real mountains, or like when in, in Flanders, in Belgium, so all the places they call mountains, I know. Like, it's just like... Yeah, <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we have these jokes about Denmark. But also when you look historically in the European, so that's probably this something lower elevation was the more original meaning of this term than the high elevation. So uh, just, yeah, the, the, just the kind of not really a question, but uh, so yeah, what does it mean when you say that there is a qualification between stone and mountain? Mm -hmm. It's a it's a very good point. Actually, it's a very good point because uh, it's um, mm, it's also one of the problems with these lexical databases because they are clicks is um, it's based on um, word lists for very many languages, and word lists were just distributed. You know, people collected data, and very often they didn't even define their terms. So now, after postscriptum, postfactum, sorry. Uh, the clicks uses what they call con concepticon. So they try to define terms just to what, what is a hand, what is a hill, what is a mountain. But it's unclear uh, to, what, um, to what extent this is a post-construction. So I think that this is very, very good. So it's one of those problems, an additional problem with using this uh, databases because we don't really know what these words mean. In fact, it was a good example of the, the stone mountain, a good example of an ambiguity. Because mm -hmm. in English, a stone can be something you hold in your hand, which is just a very small thing. Mm -hmm. But you could say this this house is made of stone, which mm -hmm. is like the material of the Right, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, in English and in French, it's codexified, mm -hmm. those two things. But in uh, in Pierre et La Pierre, uh, mm -hmm. um, but probably lots of languages uh, would dyslexify them. Mm -hmm. uh, so when, when you're faced with a questionnaire, can, do you collectify stone and mountain? Mm -hmm. well, probably. So uh, Isabel had a good question. You know, do, do you mean stone in the sense of rock? Right. Mm -hmm. uh, like the you know the hard matter, or or, or can it be uh, like a small pebble? Mm -hmm. I completely agree with you. With you. So I think that this big and data. Can be the, there, yes. So I think that this big data that you get there, you shouldn't rely on them too much 
there's like an, an overexcitement of uh, the clicks and you know you, you can pull out all kinds of uh, val valuable data but the semantics is very very crude there so what it can give you an idea right so you you get this thing and then you can go further as you say, I mean, I think that semantically, then you try to figure out what stone actually means, what mountain means, what what all these things mean, because also different different landscape. If, if you say rock or mountain, what's the difference between round rock? Right. Yes. Mm -hmm. I, I totally agree. Mm -hmm. I, I, it's not something I've thought about much before, so maybe I'm saying something very naive, but. I suppose that the, the issue of hyperonymy is very uh, crucial, that you don't want to s call something uh, co-lexification if the notion has heponyms. You don't want to say that the, the English word building co-lexifies church and school, for instance. Mm -hmm. or, right, so there, there is that all, if in your database you only have a, a heponym, mm -hmm. but the language does have uh, heponyms. You know, how do you how do you know whether the language has heponyms also that don't call it? Is that clear? Or I, I think you I think you uh, yes it's it's very clear and we had this problem so for the first paper uh, we had enormous problems because uh, um, uh, Folker got I don't know thousands of different patterns <laughs> and mm -hmm. we looked at this and then you said English collectifies um, okay let's say. In Swedish, we have maternal grandmother and mm. paternal grandmother. English has one grandmother. Do we say that English collectifies maternal grandmother and paternal grandmother? So there were lots and lots of examples of words that, kin terms, that were very specific. So you have uh, paternal this, paternal. And this gives you a wrong picture in a way. What, what is collectification? So yes, it's, uh, uh, yeah, it's, a, it's a challenge. It's a problem, right? So one, one of the things I, I had to pay attention to when I did my first paper on the mm -hmm. work on classification is, are we talking about the fact that languages can co express in the same way or must express in the same mm -hmm. way? I think that's a crucial thing. Yes, that's, a crucial, that's a crucial thing, thing yes. Uh, what appears is that languages will always be able to dis disambiguate. Um, you know, so you could say, like, the normal word in English would be grandmother or mm -hmm. granny. But if you have to, in certain mm -hmm. context, you can say, my paternal grandmother, or my, you know, you would say my mother, my father's mother. Mm -hmm. But that's not the sort of default uh, expression. And the, and so, so I, I would say, collectification is when two languages, uh, when two terms can be expressed in the same way. Uh, so if so, English allows this lady and this lady to be both called grandmother. Mm -hmm. Uh, but some languages, some Australian languages, would not, w cannot use uh, these two. So, so I, uh, in in my uh, latest paper, I have, uh, I, I keep collectification and I contrast it with dislexification, mm -hmm. uh, DIS, and and I realize that collectification is about whether languages can co-express two things, and dislexification whether they must mm -hmm. co-express two things. So it's it's asymmetrical. Mm -hmm. one. Mm -hmm. So, so, so Australian languages you cannot use the same term. So, in a way, you must dyslexify your uh, grandmother. Just like in, in, I mean, in, in, in Europe, we we cannot collectify un uh, uncle and father because these are two different people. <laughs> but we, 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 we <laughs> you see well, I don't know. Would you, <laughs> would, you that, would you then say that English dyslexifies ear and leave? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And kinship is a special mm -hmm. domain, but uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. Speaking of English, uh, uh, another uh, pitfall, but you, 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 I mean, you didn't explicitly mention it, but uh, of course, uh, it, it's there in the conversation. It's always, you know, the risk of taking English as the sort of reference uh, and uh, and looking at, uh, you know, languages that collectify concepts that are dyslexified in English, but of course. Yeah, we must not lose, you know, sight of the fact that English does a lot of classification, of course, like other languages. Yes, and that's what they are trying to. I think. I mean, it's it's a lot of clicking in the clicks. 
So because um, mm -hmm. databases don't grow on, on trees, you have to work on that. So there are <laughs> many stages and uh, uh, there's a lot of, of data on various cinetic varieties. And this helps them also to redefine some of the con concepts to make them sharper in a way. But it's also funny, I don't know how it is now, because uh, when we worked on this first paper, uh, we disco discovered that mm, there were very um, odd things like um, languages, say, in the Caucasus, um, that show the same pattern as Russian calcification. And Russian was not part of the database. And of course, the, as you say, um, in a way it was, the data was collected in Russian. So there was this additional step. So the word lists were collected by someone who spoke Russian. So the lingua franca have, has a certain impact on what you get and how you define your concepts. So yes, it's difficult, diff difficult matters. So uh, on the one hand, these databases, they are very good because you pull out all these things, but you shouldn't rely on them completely. You really have to work further, and especially with the semantic part, uh, you must be sure that you compare things that uh, really mean perhaps not exactly the same, but something comparable. There's a question. Yeah, Stefan. Yes. People in the chat, and, you know, Stefan. Ah, Stefan, yes, yes. Uh, yes, um, um, referring back to the this discussion about collexification, in my view, collexification is a comparative concept. That's where it, um, it's uh, because polysemy is not uh, as such a comparative con concept. Because uh, you, you, when you, you refer to polysemy is when you have something like a, a semantic derivation by a way or another metaphor or metonymy mainly. You, you have a transfer of a, um, a semantic concept to a, a new, another domain, which allows the term to refer to a very different uh, refer reference. But um, you know, this, this notion of a comparative concept for uh, collexification came to my mind when I heard the, um, the um, presentation about the body parts. It's very strange when a language does not, uh, 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 has the same word to refer to the hand or and the arm. It's in some way, it's very strange to speak of collexification. It's just that the body is uh, conceptualized with a different uh, limits, boundaries, and uh, among uh, the parts. So strictly speaking, it's not a collexification unless you use this term for comparison uh, across languages. That's where uh, it's important to have this tool because uh, you can, uh, you, by no means, I don't think you will speak of a polysemy for this, uh, uh, this case, uh, arm and, and uh, um, hand. It, it would be strange for me, but it, it, it makes sense when you compare uh, the way uh, the, this language uh, conceptualized the body uh, differently from other languages. Mm. So yes, 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 <laughs> yes. Again, thank you. And it's, you are completely right. So this example of arm and hem pops up all the time when people talk about polysemy and collexification. And there are um, hot debates. So um, I mentioned Anna, Anna Vizhbitska when we talked about that. So for her, the Russian ruka, which is ambiguous, I mean, it, it covers the whole um, membre. <laughs> Uh, it is ambiguous. It's it's polysemous. Polysemous. So she would say that there's one meaning, one sense which has to do with the whole thing, and then there's another sense which has to do with hand. And these appear in different contexts. You can uh, argue that these are two different senses and all that. Uh, so op opinions can can differ there. But I think that uh, what you point out to is that the most difficult cases mm, when it comes to so-called collexification, these are these metonymic um, partitions of a particular domain. So body, as we showed in this course, it can be partitioned in very many different ways. So, so there are no natural boundaries for, for mm -hmm. this. Yes, and it's, it's, it would be very 
odd to say that we have different senses if uh, if a language uh, has uh, I don't know has one word for whatever it can be long part of the body where other languages will have several different so it's yes um, what people also mm, talk about is uh, uh, you could well um, in 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 various um, uh, context people talk about emic and etic um, mm -hmm. um, categories so if you have mm, in this um, work very often by by uh, Max Planck Institute where they have stimuli for different um, situations uh, so you have let's say if you want to describe the different situations of cutting uh, you'll have one one video with someone cutting a banana and um, another person cutting something else and it doesn't mean that these situations are different senses uh, that can be collectified in a word, but they are just give you a kind of grid that can help you to understand the denotational range of different different words. So this is perhaps something to uh, to think about in connection with collectification. That it's always, I mean, it's a, it's a crude, rude uh, uh, tool. That's what we have, but you shouldn't exaggerate uh, the um, um, its um, Im its value. Yeah, mm -hmm. no, I, I fully agree that it, it's a very useful uh, uh, concept, huh? uh, but uh, I was just referring uh, to this debate, debate in some in some way it's very strange. Uh, uh, I, I fully agree that we can say that uh, um, hand and the uh, uh, arm are uh, collectified or not collectified uh, to refer to cases where it's not distinguished by a different wor uh, word. Okay, but um, if you you since you, it's clear in your mind that it's uh, just a, a tool for com uh, com comparing languages, mm -hmm. then it it involves a point of view to approach this. Because and uh, you 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 can overcome the, the obstacle that can be uh, also right away uh, raised up. It's that the uh, should we start from the point of view for for kinship relations? If we take the point of view of our languages, where you have all kind of distinction between maternal and paternal uncles and relatives and so on. Then you would say that the Indo-European languages uh, they collectified the maternal and paternal uncle uh, and so on, but, but it's um, most of the time not the point of view that is adopted because uh, we have this uh, prism of uh, of uh, Indo-European language. But you can overcome this uh, this uh, um, uh, bias. This, this uh, problem by saying, okay, we are aware that collectification is uh, a comparative uh, co a con a tool for comparing languages, yeah. and it doesn't tell you more about the, the universal way of uh, uh, the, the, the dividing the body or uh, the kinship relationships. It's, uh, it, ma it makes it, makes it uh, relative to mm -hmm. uh, uh, a Something you investigate. Yeah, to a particular, mm -hmm, to a particular purpose, to a particular, uh, yes, we, yes, and yes. And then it, it's uh, very legitimate. Yes, there is no, yes. no problem. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's I think it's it's mark. much it's much less problematic when you mm, talk about collectification mm, of well concepts or whatever coming from different domains. So ear and leaf. They belong right. to different semantic and fields. That's what I, that was yes. my first point. Uh, right. Yes. I, mm -hmm. say, unless there is a kind of a, tra a transfer of domain uh, by which the reference uh, is uh, totally different, uh, mm -hmm. like a metaphor, um, metonymy, and so on. Uh, uh, it's uh, it's very clear. In that case, uh, we there is no no problem. But uh, kind of uh, like kinship relations or different mm -hmm. terms are really problematic under this uh, aspect, this view, but uh, mm -hmm. my, 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 um, okay, my, uh, um, my point was only to, uh, to support this uh, uh, notion of collectification uh, as a very useful tool, but uh, uh, just we have to keep in mind uh, what's behind this, mm -hmm. and, uh, what's for, well, that's all.
Good, I thanks. I, I think Stefan has a good point. Mm -hmm. And pre precisely that's the difference between collectification and polysemy. That's mm -hmm. why polysemy was, uh, th which was the n usual term, uh, you know, uh, that was there, uh, was always problematic because what is polysemy in one language, you could say it's actually vagueness in, or for another case. And actually, that was you, Masha, who brought yes. brought up this point when yes. you read my draft of that paper. Yes, yes. And, uh, with, uh, with Ruka, hand and arm, mm -hmm. and that was exactly the same point, and mm -hmm. I agree to, totally. And yes, well, you, you see? You, you helped me see that <laughs> collectification and polysemy are two things. So collectification is neutral between polysemy and vagueness, mm -hmm. and that's also... But it's, it's also, I mean, it's the same for all kinds of semantic maps, right? Mm. So, so semantic maps that are so so frequently used in grammatical typology now is semantic typology. That's that's the same thing. It doesn't mean that you really have very different meanings, very different whatever it can be. But it's a it's a it's a good tool for for comparing languages, for seeing the difference. Oh, okay, there are all these hands. Yes, Yvonne was yes yes. Going back to the grandmother example, I was wondering if that's not rather a case of in English I'm talking about now case of vagueness, because if yeah. I was talking about mm. my grandmother, I don't think I'm thinking about whether it's internal or paternal. Right. As someone who has a special social relationship to me, and it's not interesting to specify, but I could, no, like you right. said. Mm -hmm. um, a good point is, I think but it's very important for my grandchildren. <laughs> <laughs> because they, so they have different, <laughs> no, no, because they are Swedes. And they, for them, it's yeah. just three. It's they're different words. They're different words. Oh. They're different words. Mm -hmm. So they, they are just two different oh. relations. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, it's not because you have the same or, the, or different words that it means different relations. No, no. Right. They're just like proper because names for them. Because we don't distinguish between cousin and nephew. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's the same <laughs> words. That right. we well, I mean, for in the case <laughs> in the case of my grandchildren, I think it's more like proper names. Mm -hmm. So they know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah, Yvonne, yes. Uh, yeah, I'd like to come back to the question of what time depth we are mm -hmm. actually examining when we look at aerial semantics. Mm -hmm. Because we have seen the study by uh, Antoinette uh, mm -hmm. about this uh, so very deep, uh, mm -hmm. long term mm -hmm. relation, or a, a, t a time when there was a connection, mm -hmm. but a long time ago. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, you also mentioned, uh, I think it was it Lamine who said that maybe it's uh, it's. Um, I don't know, shared uh, collectification enters a language more easily mm -hmm. than uh, borrowing. or So you, you have this, I mean, so we are at the same time using uh, the study of aerial semantics as a tool to investigate really long-term, I mean, uh, mm -hmm. stage that is a very long time ago and a very recent one. Yeah, and that's a s in, in uh, Hayward's list of um, collectifications of Ethiopian languages, I also have that feeling that some of these um, observations or some of the parameters are fairly recent, just since mm -hmm. I mean, just Amhar uh, since Amharic is used as a lingua franca, while others m may have a longer history. So I, I see a problem here too, which time depth are we actually mm -hmm. examining? Mm -hmm. well, that's yeah. why, um, mm, I mean, they studied that, um, our second study by Volker and myself, mm -hmm. Uh, it was um, the idea was just to to check to what extent uh, closely related languages differ in their on the one hand the, f the words themselves and on the other hand in their polysemy patterns. Mm -hmm. So, but it turned out so the idea was what what's, what spreads easier. Mm -hmm. You can borrow words. I mean, the the basic vocabulary of the Swedish Swedish list you normally don't borrow them very easily. But you can borrow mm, mm, polysemy patterns. They they spread more easily. But for other parts of the lexicon, it can be the other way around. So the idea was very good, but then it turned out that it was very difficult to get material. So even even and, and that's where you understand that you look at the in the like your European languages, languages that we sort of well occasionally know, and you discover a lot a lot of problems w with the data. But I think that, in principle, this is a very interesting question. So if you compare closely related languages uh, and just try to figure out uh, which words could have been borrowed uh, and what, what the meanings of these words are, to what extent the meanings would correspond to each other. Mm. Mm. 
Yeah, just a, a point on aerial semantics as we're as researchers are uncovering more and more um, different semantic patterns, lexicosemantic patterns. It seems that this is knocking down more and more areas, aerial specific features. For example, uh, when I was listening to, to Yvonne's uh, lectures on the Ethiopian area, uh, something I thought was specific to Asia that was using the Zembel verbs to form equitive, uh, comparative equitive constructions. So, you know, there you have it in Ethiopia. Okay, you did point out a couple of features that might hold out. That's the, the fire, firewood, and the eye, mm. uh, eye of the day that seem to be very, very specific. But nearly everything that, that's been uh, found for Southeast Asia, including Semitic languages, mm -hmm. you can find usually in Africa, or if not in, uh, in Meso or South America, like the child fruit, mm -hmm. um, exceed comparatives, mm -hmm. equitive comparatives. Say becoming a that's more yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, which is even more yeah, widespread. Yeah, yeah. yeah, and dwell, mm. dwell is a yeah, but but yeah. That's, uh, important point that uh, we you had nice examples of very universal mm -hmm. you know, uh, connections or classification like C and no. I mean, mm -hmm. very universal. But you can find in all language families, more or less all continents at least, and and some are very local like. Uh, firewood and fire uh, mm -hmm. in your example but as you say I mean there are many in between cases where we it, it's hard to say you know like it's probably a universal mm -hmm. univer potential universal potentially universal mm -hmm. yeah potential universal uh, there's a tendency for humans to see for from homo sapiens to see a connection between these two things but that potential actually is becomes is actualized in maybe six different language mm -hmm. families not everywhere. So mm -hmm. it's uh, it's neither universal nor super local. It's mm -hmm. and uh, we I'm sure there are many many cases. Mm -hmm. So you think there's kind of a set and of a set of possible cognitive universals mm -hmm. or semantic universals that languages can draw on, but they don't I, have to. I guess so. Yeah. Um, uh, and in and in, in there are also many. I don't have an example probably, but there are many um, connections like. Uh, uh, I can't remember. And in a talk, I, I actually it was in in Martin Van Hove's uh, group mm -hmm. like 15 years ago in Lacan, and I, there were talks, uh, different talks. Mm -hmm. I can't remember who brought up the example of mother, uh, the mother of the house, meaning a big house. Mm -hmm. So there are some languages where it's, it's, Sydney, it's Southeast Asia. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. Mm -hmm. it's Southeast Asia. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> and so in Vanuatu, I had one language, mm -hmm. only one yeah. out of 20 languages I looked at. Which had exactly this, like a mother mm -hmm. of a canoe meant mm -hmm. a, a big boat. Mm -hmm. uh, and I thought that's mm -hmm. co that's cool. Mm -hmm. And then someone else from Africa mm -hmm. <laughs> said, yeah. "I have this." In one. So, mm -hmm. so because we have, you know, it's exciting to to find the same connections in several families. Now, do we want to say, okay, we found a universal? I mean, in a w in a way, yes, but it's only, it, you know, it's not a. It, but maybe our terminology is not. Good enough because we, you know it, it's neither full universal nor a mm -hmm. local thing. It's some the connection between you know a mother is to a child what big is to small. Basically, that's a sort of universal mm -hmm. analogy. Mm -hmm. and then that is transformed into a lexical thing like a collectification pattern in some languages, and in other languages it would be maybe um, it would take another shape like an expression or proverb or you know, mm -hmm. um, but. It's not always it, yeah. absolutely right, and and I think that wh what should we do? I mean, what 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 can we do to this? Should we? I mean, uh, my point, huh? Set up a database. Yeah. Where it's a, well, it's a database, but it's we also could we we could explore this. And uh, uh, my my point is that um, uh, th th these different. Mm, Fields are disconnected, right? So people working in Ethiopia work in Ethiopia. People working in Southeast Asia work in Southeast Asia. People working on something else work on something else. And uh, I mean, with if you may just remark on this, mm. just, I wonder whether this is necessary because I mean sorry, it was w well this is necessary. I mean just because looking at the all universal things, mm. if, if something like a connection is mm. semantically uh, natural change mm. like metonymy, mm -hmm. metonymy, or whatever, so 
that is always potentially mm -hmm. universal. So mm -hmm. it happens mm -hmm. somewhere, it just randomly happens in this area, maybe in another area, mm -hmm. or randomly happens in just one area, but it can always happen in another area again. So what is more, so that means, I mean, the fact that you found this in Australia and also in, in, in Africa, uh, that's not a problem. So the, what is more relevant for like, for aerial studies is whether you can delimit it uh, with your neighbors, like with these studies, you find it here, but not anywhere in the vicinity. So that's the yeah, really yeah. And I don't think you need to, you have to, or you need to look at the, the whole world. So to worry whether if we find like uh, tree and, 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 and firewood here, whether we wouldn't also find it somewhere else. So I don't think this is a very relevant question to ask. Yeah, uh, so. Um, mm. For instance, when, when we worked, when I, I worked many years ago on the Circumbaltic area, which had been proposed as an area, uh, so we looked at various features and we compared them to uh, um, the, um, so the languages spoken around the Baltic Sea. Um, and we compared them to, let's say, the rest of Europe, the rest of Asia, to the whole world. And you found that these properties were on different levels. Some of them were strikingly unique for some of the languages, you couldn't find them. Some uh, were not at all unique for, let's say, Asia. Or some of them were very common cross-linguistically, but in Europe, mm -hmm. they, were, they were unique. So of course, you have to operate on different levels. And I think that um, um, for, um, for, for semantics, for lexical semantics, you really need more systematic studies of uh, semantic domains, semantic polysemies, and all this. So what mother? For instance, it's it's a it's a beautiful it's a beautiful mm, um, domain that can be explored uh, cross linguistically. So, what kinds of um, polysemy patterns you find? How what what um, uh, semantic derivations from from various kin terms? Uh, Magisov has this very beautiful paper uh, on mother on mother on mother on on mother, but it's mainly on Southeast Asia. And there's then they like work on child. So Juravsky have this semantic map for child going in different directions and very often being diminutives. And then you can have this whole big cross linguistic study. So you can just uh, map in my languages, we have this, and in, in our languages, we have this. But, uh, but for mother or for father or not, that there's nothing like that. So, of course, there can be some universal. So Metisov comes up with some universal. Um, directions for how the meaning of this word can develop, uh, but then that it can be instantiated differently in different languages, in perhaps in different areas. So where you find that, OK, um, one of his directions is something like main or principle, and you see that, OK, it can be instantiated in Arabic and this language, but in Southeast Asia, this is massive. So the, the frequency of the different phenomena and the density and the productivity of different phenomena can also be a, a symptom of um, a reality. Uh, can I add that? I think that this question of, I mean, ideally, I know it, it's, it would be possible to measure how the degree of universality or degree of commonness or, or, or mm -hmm. of a certain pattern. Um, one, one reason would be because we want to know and because it's interesting. But another reason is because it is crucial when you have a sort of historical argument, mm -hmm. uh, as you mentioned about, you know, was there contact between Australian people and Papuan people at a certain point in time? And that's an important question for archaeologists and so on, and geneticists. And in terms of uh, co the comparative method has never mm -hmm. been able to, f to find any connection between Papuan and Australia so far. And so in a way, that's a promising uh, so Antoinette Schaffer and, and mm -hmm. Sam Brockley and Henry's paper was, you know, a promising proposal to say, mm -hmm. okay, comparative method is not helping here, but collectification might help. Okay. Now, interest. It was a crucial point, I think, in the argument to say we found a collectification which is found, which is shared between Australia and Papua, but also that is rare in the world. Mm -hmm. But imagine if the argument had been. Oh, we ha we find a collectification found in, in, in between Australia and Papua, which is between here and understand. 
Mm -hmm. And that would be much less convincing because we, we would know that, well, here I understand is going to be collectified, you know, mm -hmm. or, or associated in many languages. So I think this sort of scale, mm -hmm. which I I'm portraying as a sort of linear scale, but probably is more complex than that. But this scale of universality, you know, super common, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. I, yeah, you know, yeah. half, mm -hmm. half common, <laughs> mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, and super rare lo local. That's I, I, I propose that we <laughs> maybe, maybe we liberate the people. Yes, on well, OK. <laughs> <laughs> and we have in the room. Uh, um, and yeah, all of you who are here, you are. You're free. No, you're, <laughs> you're, <laughs> you're, you're li liberated. You can stay, you can come to Lacan and have a coffee or I don't oh, know. Oh, that's good. It sounds good, yeah. Mm -hmm. We can move on to the informal ah, part right, of the yes. discussion. <laughs> yes, so we leave this. Yeah.